Ah, Aphex Twin, aka Richard D. James, one of the pioneers of IDM. I enjoy his drum tracks very much. They can be sophisticated, minimalistic, weird, but they always integrate perfectly with the rest of the composition. And of course, they are often full of vintage drum machines, which is always a big plus. After listening to his songs for many years, I noticed a few drum techniques that kept popping up. So I decided to dig deeper. In this video, I'll show you six of my favorite Aphex Twin signature moves that you can also use to spice up your own beats, whether it's in your drum machine, your DAW, or any other sequencer. Hello everyone, this is... Aphex Twin often uses found sounds in his drum tracks. Found sounds are all kinds of samples from the world around us, anything you might find interesting. They can either be used as additional layers for other drum sounds, or entirely on their own. A good example for this is Alberto Balsam from the I Care Because You Do album. For the intro, you strum your lower lip with your index finger. I have no idea what this sound is called. Anyway, pitch that down. Reduce the sample rate. Roll off the highs. Some reverb. Done. Now on to the actual beat. This is our foundation. I just used some acoustic drum samples. On top of them, I'll add this chair dragging sound to the beginning of the bar. But maybe let's only have it repeat every other bar. You could do this by doubling the length of the pattern and removing this step on the second page, but I'll simply add a conditional that tells it to play only every other time. And as a finishing touch, I'll add a typewriter on top of the shaker. Let's make a copy of this pattern and lose the cymbal and chair. The kick and rim shot are replaced by these two metallic found sounds. Interestingly, the rolls are now reversed. The bass drum is replaced by the higher metal beat and the rim shot is replaced by the lower one. Black Box Live Recorder 21F is a pretty recent track and a wonderful celebration of Roland's various mid-O drum machines. It begins with the TR-707 and this 4-bar drum pattern. The Oxy-1 sequencer controls the Taldrum plugin, into which we've loaded up some Gold Baby 707 samples. There are lots of effects in the original, but on here it's just some reverb and a space echo type delay on the rim shot. And again more prominently on the kick. There is swing on here, but otherwise it's a pretty harmless rhythm, right? But it will get progressively more twitchy and nervous. I'll show you two stages of this transformation, so let's make a copy of the pattern we can work on. The idea is to add more and more drum hits around the existing ones. Let's say for starters in the second bar, we place two more hi-hats, here and here. Let's loop this page. But that doesn't sound Aphex Twinny at all. Yet. The trick is to make these new sounds very short. In Taldrum you can do that by turning off the one-shot option of an instrument. Then the sample length is directly controlled by the incoming note. Long notes for the full sample and very short notes for glitchy noise bursts. The only thing I have to do now is reduce the note or gate length for the new steps, which will shorten the sample. Those short hi-hats need a lot more energy, which is why I've saved up a bit of headroom on the velocity until now. These shortened hats sound like tiny bursts of noise. It's a very nice contrast to the regular hits. Also, placing those glitches on the even steps really brings out the swing. Now the pattern starts dancing. 
If you're not sure how to change the sample length in your device or software, then take a look at the video description. There's a link to a free Patreon post in which we've written up a few more ideas. In bar 3, we'll trim this snare down. And now you see why I've programmed all the snares with a length of two steps. They need this to fully ring out. In bar 4, we'll add two more short hats at the end. The first one is a bit longer. The second one gets less velocity. Let's hear all four bars together. Okay, now that you know how it's done, watch me make a third, even busier version of the pattern. We'll go through it bar by bar. I'll add regular notes as well as short ones. Let's listen to all three patterns. Pay attention to how everything escalates. A spot effect is when an effect is not used on the whole track all the time, but selectively only in specific places. I have three patterns from T69 Collapse programmed into the syntact, on which we can demonstrate this. This all sounds too uniform, so let's break things up. We want to add some dimension and expand the depth of the drums at the end of the second pattern. Ok, so this is a dry snare hit. And now I'm going to parameter lock the reverb send level for it. Now it sounds like this. 
If you try this technique, make sure you're not just turning the reverb volume up and down. The reverb needs to be on all the time. We just selectively feed it tiny bits of our drums. The important thing is to treat it as a send effect, which the electron boxes all do. You can give the snare heads different send levels depending on how much you want to accent them. Listen how this escalating explosion of reverb transforms the drums. But you're not just limited to reverb. Experiment with whatever effects you have available, for instance delay, distortion, or a stuttering gate. By the way, you can find all transcriptions from this video and over 100 more on our Patreon, plus a lot of cheat sheets for the various devices we've used in our videos. Ratchets are a big part of what people associate with the Aphex Twin sound. It's what gives the drums this techy, glitchy feeling. Ratchets are also known as repeats, sub-steps or rolls, and on most sequences, they can be programmed very easily. Here I simply tell the sequencer that I want to break a step into equal parts. At a subdivision of 2, this still sounds pretty natural. 30 second notes at this speed are something a human drummer could easily pull off. But increase that to 4 or 8, and you're clearly giving away that we are leaving the realm of what's humanly possible. Unless you're JD Beck, I'm still not convinced he's not a robot. For our first ratcheting example, we'll examine Mini Pop 67 from the Syro album. By the way, this is another good example for shortened sounds, so pay attention to the note lengths in there as well. They say less is more, and in this case, that's certainly true. There's just an occasional repeat sprinkled in. For example, let this snare glitch out for a split second. I'll give it 5 repeats, which is equal to 80th notes. The repeat makes it too intense, so let's dial back the velocity. Do note that on some sequences, like the internal one in the syntact, the last note in the repeat group will ring out. That's because each repeated note has the full length of the step. If you don't want that, you have to shorten the note length. Here on the Oxy1, each of the repetitions is an equal fragment of the step thereon, and that already gives me the result I want. Just two different approaches you should be aware of. So, it can be enough to just give the audience a clue that something is off. Keep them guessing. A gentleman's glitch, if you will. Sometimes that can be more effective than going full Venetian snares on your listeners. To up our ratcheting game, we could take a look at Helios Fan, a classic from his selected Ambient Works 85-92 album. This is a mostly harmless 909 hi-hat pattern. But now I'll turn the closed hats right before beats 2 and 3 into triple sub-steps. If you're in a door, set your note grid to 30 second triplets to place these. This introduces some baseline nervousness into the track. Perhaps the equivalent of having a little too much caffeine or sugar with some mildly annoying eye twitching on the side. Later the two open hats, including the one closed hat in between, disappear. And instead we place a step with six subdivisions, right here. These would be 64th triplets in your door. The universe demands balance, so let's introduce an opposing force. I'll use a conditional to make this step play only every other time. Now we're alternating between full glitch and silence. Oh, and did you notice that the pitch of the hi-hats goes up whenever there are more sub-steps? This brings us to... Put simply, you can turn any sound into an oscillator. Let's take this 909 rim shot for instance. If we loop this sample, then right now the individual hits are spaced wide enough for you to perceive them as separate sounds. But as we shorten the sample and thereby increase the frequency at which it loops, we start to hear this as one coherent sound. 
and we can control the pitch by varying the length of the loop. Instant glitchy goodness. By the way, in the intro of Mangle 11 from the Drugs album, he does exactly this, but with the aim and break. And we get the same effect when we program ratchets. If we divide a single step into enough substeps, the sounds will meld into one. The point at which this happens, of course, depends on the BPM of your project and the sample itself. First 44 from the Collapse EP is a great example using ratchets on 808 hi-hats. The hard part was figuring out that this uses a 30 second note triplet scale. This means that internally, the sequencer will actually be running three times faster than normal for this pattern, at a breakneck speed of 447 BPM. Two bars will cost us a whopping 96 steps. Let's slow this down so we can analyze it. After the initial rapid-fire series of hi-hats, you can see that they are decelerating. The space between the hits keeps growing. And the final part is a long series again. These are all double sub-steps, so they're even faster 64th triplets. As a final touch, I'll add a volume swell on the last part. That gives the hats a lot of energy, and it makes it feel as if they're zooming right past you. Here's a radical thought, leave out the drums entirely. FX Swin has done this a few times, for example on Rhubarb, Avril 14th, or Lycan. You just need a beautiful ambient piano or synth piece. If no drums is a little too drastic for you, you could always go the stone and focus route and use a simple hypnotic metronome over your ambient washes. A metronome that's gradually decelerating. Like honey, slowly dripping down. Seconds stretch towards infinity. Hey, my heart rate is going down. Space and time lose their meaning. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Did I leave the stove on? Why am I speeding up again? I don't know if I'm ready for this. Does the broken metronome method feel too unbalanced for you? Maybe Thaw is more your cup of tea. That track has a very steady metronomic bass drum. On small loudspeakers, the most prominent thing you'll hear is the transient click. But the body of the kick is there, it's just tuned very, very low. That leaves plenty of space in the mids for other stuff. Crystal is one of my favorite examples for this technique. Wait, are you surprised that it's pronounced Crystal and not Extal? Then you need the definitive Aphex Twin Song and Album Pronunciation Guide. Crystal. It's an abbreviation for crystal, which is used in electronic schematic diagrams. Drug use. <laughs> this is actually one of his many hidden math exercises. It's pretty obvious, but here's a short explanation. Being the computer geek Richard is, 4-bit refers to the binary system, and the biggest 4-bit number is 15. 90 is hexadecimal, which equals 157. API stands for American Petroleum Institute, and it's a clue what you have to do with these numbers. If you enter them into the text search in the API catalog, it turns out that they're a bottomless number, which has a G in front of it. And G is the seventh letter in the alphabet. Next up is E, a mathematical constant. The 6 seems pretty inconspicuous at first, but don't be fooled. This is where most people trip up. Upon closer inspection, it turns out it's an upside-down 9. Hammer that into your pocket calculator, and you'll see that the actual song title is about... 19. Anyway, back to Crystal. As I said, it's one of my favorite examples for this technique. We just need a bass drum with a long decay. 
Once the listener has gotten used to the sound, we start trimming the tails on certain steps. You could use the same techniques from the super short sound segment, but here I think it's easier to use a different one. I'll just put another kick wherever I want the sound to stop. And then I'll reduce its velocity to minimum. That makes it inaudible, but it chokes the preceding kick. On many sequencers you could also use automation to reduce the volume, hold or decay. For more ideas again check the video description. The result is that this sudden stopping becomes part of the rhythm itself. It adds a new layer to it. So, now I guess we'll try to put all of these techniques to good use. Oh wait, we still need a track title. Richard seems to have given up on proper track names and just Kaiser Soze's the thing with whatever unobtainium gear he is lying in front of him at the time. So... Hmm. 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 Perfect. And as always, a big shout out to all of our patrons. Thanks to your support, we can keep making these videos. Videos. Video. 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 Bye.